Marcus, thanks very much for coming in. Um, so One Spatial provides software and services to manage spatial data on a, on a very large scale. Can you just um, expand on that a little bit for us, please? Okay, so if you firstly look at One Spatial's client list in terms of its historic clients that it has, they're best termed as the authoritative data providers in the world. The likes of Ordnance Survey Great Britain, Ordnance Survey Ireland, and most recently the US Census, as well as looking at hydrographic agencies, mariner and shipping and aeronautical in the form of AIDU and the RAF. These are organisations where criticality of dealing with spatial data is absolutely immense. They get the location wrong, it's not as valid and up-to-date as it should be at that given point in time. It gives people a real problem in terms of losing life or deploying things in terms of a cost that's just beyond what they should be carrying. One Spatial is really unique in terms of its ability to deal with this spatial data, understand the relationships, dependent whether it's air, sea, land, or even space, uh, and bring all of the harness, all that knowledge and insight so that the data is fine grained and it's the most relevant and up to date as it possibly can be. We've got a huge amount of tools that support that process, whether it's data collection, whether it's editing, whether it's validation or generalization, some of the specifics. And then most recently, in terms of the ability that we have to conflate different sources of data and bring them together, harmonize them so they've got the most valid and most accurate data set to work from. And one spatial's ability to manage and fine grain that data is absolutely unique in terms of our ability to manage it at scale as well. As it gets larger and larger and larger, you know, our technology deals with it in a way that other technology just doesn't. So the business is uh, still very much in transition. Um, you've been packaging all of this expertise you've got into IPR, into intellectual property, uh, and, and opening it up so, so that you can leverage relationships with people like um, Esri and here and so on. Can you just talk us through the strategy and the thinking behind it? So look, we've got some world-class IPR. We've wrapped it up now into a series of products. Uh, the market is there, we're seeing that in terms of the revenue that we're generating ourselves and the clients are demanding it. Um, the, the world out, out there has you know, some mega vendors that dominate the desktops within industry, depending on what sector you're looking at. If you're in ERP, you, you've got the likes of SAP that dominate it. In the geospatial market, you've got the likes of Esri that is the sort of de facto desktop standard with their applications set out there. The products that we have in terms of getting market access is firmly around partner strategy now with the organisation. There's a certain amount of revenue that we can achieve in terms of working our own way and in terms of pushing this business model forward. There's the cash requirement to do that. Uh, however, you come back to the fact that we have some great IPIs productized. The clients out there are demanding it, how do we get market access? So you know, one of the key strategies has been to work with these third parties, the first one being Esri, where we've taken a core component part of our technology and embedded it within the Esri platform to bring uh, a, a degree of insight, validity and control to the spatial data and giving clients the ability to manage it and conflate different data sets. Uh, that enforces quality and control within their data across the organisation. So we intend to push forward with that strategy more and more. Um, you know, Esri, as is, 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 is we've turned Esri from a very competitive relationship that we had to now one that, uh, that we jointly go to market together on a, on a global basis. And uh, you know, that's taken some time and a, quite a, a lot of work on both sides and a lot of goodwill and a lot of trust. But we're in a position now where we have a, a really firm product offering that, uh, that we can push out to our clients and we can push out to clients around the world that use and value the Esri technology as well. So you know, we look forward to doing more and more of that and also deploying more and more components of our technology within Esri and within other vendors. So how big is your addressable market and, and what is driving growth both within the GIS market and for One Spatial? I mean, the, you know, if you look at the headlines for the geo service industry, it's, it's immense. You know, you're in the hundreds of billions of dollars. You know, we're a small Cambridge technology company, you know, doing circa 25 million. We've got to be realistic at this slice of that market segment that we can actually go after. Given where the business has historically been positioned in the authoritative content, it's really, really small. So we've productized the IP now into a form whereby we can sell the technology in its vanilla form to many, many other clients in many sectors and strike strategic relationships with third parties that get value out of the technology that their clients are now demanding. 
in terms of being as up to date and as valid as they can and being able to manage more large scale data and do some very unique things with it. So the, the addressable market for us is, is pretty large. It's in the tens of billions of dollars in terms of what, we're, what, we, what we see as our target market. In terms of what we're aiming at, it's about us making the best use of the resources that we've got within, our, within the company and geographically where we're located as well has an important, play, important part to play in that as well. You know, at the moment we're a UK and European centric business. We've recently acquired a US distributor and uh, you know, that is a real huge addressable market. And by its very nature, even from a government standpoint, the use of geospatial data in the US is immense. You're talking about a federal country where they had a federated data set across all government agencies and departments, and that then filters into cities and municipalities. So, you know, the, the sectors are pretty immense. You know, we're just taking incremental, incremental slices of those market segments and addressing them with our technology. So looking at this transition, you're investing in um, productizing the IP. Um, what is the impact that the transition is having on the financials at the moment? Uh, and what do you really see as the benefits going forward for, for the business? I mean, there's a significant transition in the business model, one of moving from you know, developer day rates against a client to selling products. So you've got the switch of resources within the company to develop the product, so you're not going to do so many chargeable hours unless you just continue to up it. So that's, that's a dilemma in itself in terms of managing it and the, you know, the criticality of getting these products out to market in a timely fashion. Once they're sold in market as a product, you know, the, the conventional software model has been to sell a perpetual license and support. That no longer holds true across, you know, the, the, the main industry verticals are there. They're more sophisticated. They want to purchase it on an annualised basis. So we're having, we've adopted a SaaS licensing model. So have the partners that we work with in terms of Esri with their, you know, core ArcGIS platform. It's a per user per annum seat basis. So, you know, if we were to sell a perpetual license to a given client, the, you know, us to recoup the same amount of money, we need something like a three-year agreement to do that. But the P&L impact is quite significant because you're just flushing through the P&L the monthly charges that you have. So, you know, a three-year um, deal that you land with a given client, you can only book a third of it in that given year or as many months that you've got to run on it. So it, it could have a profound impact on the, on the revenue line and that's one of the reasons why as we move forward we'll begin to, to report a bookings number where people can understand what the booked revenue is as well as a backlog that we've historically reported on the business and we do you know carry a very very healthy backlog as well and we don't see that ever changing but as we get more focused around a SaaS model the, the booking number is going to be critical to give investors confidence in terms of what we're what we're achieving. So what are the key milestones that investors should look for over the course of the next year uh, so that they can measure your process, your, your progress in effecting this transition? You know, the critical, you know, some of the critical measures that they need to look at is the bookings number in terms of where we are. Uh, we're in a period now whereby the P&L is carrying all of the cost of the strategic initiatives that we've undertaken. You know, we look forward with great confidence because you know, the strategic initiatives are yielded products that we're now selling into market and we're getting a significant deal flow and pipeline that's been strengthened and we're converting these deals as well. So we sit in a very comfortable position. We just need to inform the market and we'll do that when we have a greater level of confidence and visibility over forward years. Mm -hmm.